Hello, hello everyone, and welcome back to the RimWorld Gun Empire series. My good friends, I am ever so excited to see you here once again today. Today, my friends, as you've most likely saw in the video thumbnail and title, unless I decided to change it to be a little bit cheeky, we have some very big goals to achieve. But obviously, we're not going to achieve anything by sitting here and talking about it. The first type of research I would like to do today is in Recon Armor. This will obviously unlock several different types of armors that we can create and sell but one in particular I would like to create and provide to Richard is the Deathstroke armor from the Deathstroke armor mod of course. Downs here would immediately begin her extensive research into the field and knowings of recon armor but of course that's going to take her quite a while. Maybe we'll check in on someone such as Richard who is currently making more pre-charged turrets for us to sell to the rebels and or marshals. But what's this? It would appear the dirty scoundrels from the Mountain Devil Mafia have arrived and plan on raiding us. The raiding party appears to be fairly well equipped with a stolen Marshall Service Jeep joining in. Truth be told though, the Jeep was the least of our concerns after I seen this massive hybrid between an Impid and a Thromboian dual wielding minigun turrets. Holy shit. Well, it looks like the MDM has really brought their A game once again. I suppose we're gonna have to whip out our secret weapon. The old tried and true roadkill tank. Now, I will say that this raid was a little bit unfair because the raiders were supposed to prepare before their attack, but they were deciding to go directly through our base to get to the area where they wanted to prepare, so we got a, uh, a few good shots in at them before that. So many good shots, in fact, that they were actually deciding to retreat, but they wouldn't get out of here before we destroyed that damn dirty jeep with our roadkill tank. We had one direct hit on the jeep, and it was trying to leave, of course, along with many of the members who were scrambling out of the area, then we got another shot and it was all gone, and the only thing left were a few of the remaining members who were trying to break through our doors to leave, but of course we surrounded them very quickly and started raining hellfire down upon them. And just like that, with the blink of an eye, yet another raid by the MDM thwarted. Of course though, us defeating the raid was not the only good news, for you see, two of these impids that had survived after we shot them down actually had some decent skills, so we decided that we would capture them, take them back home, and begin trying to recruit them. And this was actually the first genuine test of our roadkill tank against any other type of vehicle, and must I say that it done one hell of a job. Yet another bright side of defeating the raid, and specifically that jeep, is that we got plenty of steel and plasteel from it as well, which is going to be very useful. Once we had finally got both of our brand new prisoners into the prison cells, we immediately began trying to heal them to ensure that they wouldn't bleed out on our nice, clean sandstone floors. And as mentioned earlier, we are not going to be enslaving either of them, as I would actually like to have them both for our mercenaries. We would then end up spending several hours trying to haul in all of the weapons that were dropped by the Mafia Raiders, many of which were very horrible quality, awful, or poor. Some were made of some decent materials like plasteel, though, so yeah, little wins here and there. Of course, now that our population is going to be increasing once more, which is something like we've discussed that is most likely going to continue happening happening over and over, I decided to try and get ahead of the starvation curve here, especially with it being winter time and the snow already killing many of our plants outside, uh, of course by going ahead and creating another growing zone on the inside next to our other two. This growing zone was basically identical to the other two, except the planter boxes were made out of slate because we were running low on limestone at the time. Another difference uh, with this planting zone here, growing zone, is that we're actually going to be growing some eggplants. The reason for that is because we can't grow corn inside, but the eggplants have a similar harvest yield, meaning we'll have just as much nutrition. Now finally, with another large area to grow plants that we can consume, we're going to need a little bit more space in our food storage room to actually put all of the eggplants and whatnot that we'll be getting, so we ended up doing that as well. And then just something brief to touch on for a moment, something you guys were telling me about in the comments last episode and something I noticed is that this solar panel up here is being blocked somewhat by the mountain, so we deconstructed that one, and I didn't actually build a replacement because I have some pretty big plans for power. As you could probably tell, this same small hill is actually blocking people such as raiders that spawn in on the northwest side from being able to come to the northeast side without going through our base, which is causing a few issues like the raid earlier. So I actually decided that I would dig out a large tunnel, that way anyone, visitors, raiders, whoever that are spawning in on that side will have a way to come through the mountain without having to go through 
to our base, of course. It is pretty big, so that does mean that enemy vehicles are still going to be able to get through. Unfortunately, it kind of needs to be that way, though. That way we can get our vehicles through if need be as well. Unfortunately, however, as we were digging out the tunnel, we ended up having a prison break. Our two new impid friends, who we thought were our friends, are apparently trying to escape, and they're doing a pretty damn good job. I would end up sending Otto and Shinichi to the left side to try and deal with the blue impid, and of course, Scott came in with his rifle and started firing at him as well. This took a little while, but eventually we took down this impid, and I was very worried that the one that went through the right side may be escaping. But apparently that was no issue. If you heard those few rifle bullets there, it looks like it was Richard firing at this impid, unfortunately killing her, so no more prisoner. And yeah, I was a little bit sad about that. That news kind of sucked. We only have one prisoner there that's going to become a mercenary, but in good news, we finally finished up this tunnel, meaning that any raiders or anything will be able to come through, and we don't have to worry about them trying to go directly through our base. Ha <laughs> ha, achievement. Of course, however, just because they don't have to anymore doesn't mean that they won't try to go through this section of our base, and honestly, this whole time, having to deal with a war on two fronts occasionally, either on the left side or the right side with raiders coming at us from either one, has been a little bit frustrating, so I've actually decided to destroy all of our defenses on that side, and uh, we would actually end up building double thick sandstone walls, and on top of that, we would also end up building a brand new geothermal power generator, which was very much needed, as you'll see in just a moment. We did, of course, leave our garage door and our tunnel on this side, though, that way we can actually leave when forming a caravan, and we don't have to worry about any issues there. As you can see, though, once we finally finished our geothermal power generator, all the lights were coming back on. We're really using up a lot of power, so two generators was very much needed. As you can see, with this monumentous project finally completed, we literally moved mountains, and we actually used the stone from those mountains to build more walls on the left there, but uh, they shouldn't be coming through that side at all unless they're sappers or something and they try to destroy the walls, but if that were to happen, we have much bigger issues at hand. Of course, while we're still on the topic of moving mountains, I'm actually going to set up a mining camp nearby the base for a little bit to try and collect some resources like steel and hopefully some components. But of course, we're going to need somewhere for our people to sleep, so we built some cloth tents. Once we finally completed that, we ended up loading up Scott, Rulant, Otto, Nino, as well as Kirkos into the rifle runner, and we headed out to some small hills nearby the base here and finally set up our camp. You may notice that all of our people here are wearing gas masks. There is a fairly good reason for that. Most of this tile here that we're actually going to be mining on is polluted. Just like right next to our base, there is a holy shit ton of polluted tiles. This basically all throughout the desert here. It's, it's all pollution, of course. So we don't want anyone rotting their lungs or just dying in general. Even with how disgusting and polluted the tile was, Scott actually remarked to Ruin that the smell was somewhat pleasant, almost sweet, maybe like mustard gas, perhaps. Anyhow, though, we finally set up our tents for the night and all of our members would get a good night's rest just before the sun came up and they would begin mining steel out of a very small hill nearby. Of course, with this being literally the only reason that that they were all camping in this area. As you can imagine, there wasn't much time for recreation, so we had a few minor break risks pop up, but luckily no one actually broke, and we would continue mining this hill for any other resources that we could find. Uh, we actually ended up trying to do some strip mining and trying to look for components. Before we would actually finally depleting this mountain of all of its resources, though, I would end up sending Kirkos back in the rifle runner all the way home with most of the steel that we had collected thus far. That way she could actually drop it off since the rifle runner can't carry everyone and all of the steel that we've been mining. If I'm not mistaken, I believe the rifle runner could carry roughly about 1500 steel or so, and I want to say we got close to maybe 4000 out of the small hill that we had been mining at, so we had to make quite a few different trips seeing how we had other people that could carry some of it in their pockets, but not a lot of course. Finally though, after making several of those trips, we finally returned home with all of our people as as well as all of our steel. Unfortunately, there were no components to be found within that mountain, no compacted machinery. There was a little bit of coal, but I decided it really wasn't worth it to make yet another trip, so we ended up leaving that behind. I do somewhat regret that, though, because we could have made a little bit of silver from it. Regardless of leaving the coal behind, though, the trip was still very much well worth it because we had an absolute shit ton of steel to work with now. However, because of our newfound resources, even with our steel, plasteel, and components, 
having another spot in our production room, I noticed that our two current storage rooms are getting extremely full. Pretty soon, well, actually currently, we don't really have anywhere to store anything else that we actually need to put in storage, right? So I actually ended up planning out a brand new storage room just on the other side of the walls from our growing zones. Now you know me, the rat daddy, I'm not very good at math, but I want to say that this tripled and or quadrupled our storage rooms as these are much larger and we actually ended up having to build many, many more shelves which was completely A-OK -okay and fine by me because of course our storage rooms not only work as storage rooms for any items and whatnot but they also actually work as an overflow room for things like resources such as steel, uh, guns, and knives, and other weapons that we produce. So for us it takes a lot of room. As we were constructing our new storage rooms, we actually ended up recruiting the impid known as a Biko. And as you can see with his skill set, he's pretty good at shooting, uh, cooking, as well as crafting. He's also a too smart cannibal. Other than that, most of his other skills are either mediocre or pretty lackluster. And you already know, with such a good shooting skill, of course he's going to become one of our mercenaries, so we sent him into our new armory where he would equip some combat armor as well as a plasteel sword and a new rifle. Ah yes, looking very dapper, Abiko, ready to take on any enemies of the SNR Rifle Company, foreign or domestic. Now that we finally finished up our brand new storage room, I've decided that we would actually repurpose our old one for some slave barracks. Now this isn't near as good as individual rooms unfortunately, however it would be perfect for any overflowing slave population that we end up having in the very near future. It was also around this time that Scott actually developed an addiction to Psychite tea. He had a mental break and he was binging on Psychite products, all we had was tea. If you remember, Roz used to need Psychite tea and I forgot to stop making it, so now we need it for Scott unfortunately. But my friend, it is finally time, the moment you've all been waiting for, a new research product. Yes indeed, we are going to be researching small nukes, the very first nuclear bomb technology on the planet of Degum. Not made in any top secret laboratory by any specialized rebel scientist or highly decorated military scientist of the Marshal Service. Nay, my friends, made by the estranged wife of a warlord in the desert. Speaking of which, as Downs is researching the devastating power of nuclear bombs, I would actually have Richard begin making his very own new set of Deathstroke armor. Now of course this series and universe has nothing to do with Deathstroke or the DCU or DC or anything like that, I just really like the way it looked and I think Richard looks very good in it. I think the color scheme also really helps set him apart from the mercenaries as he is one of the founding members and is a warlord. By the time that we had finally finished this new armor for Richard, we had also finally finished our extensive research into small nukes, but of course we hadn't planned on stopping there, we were actually going to immediately begin researching searching large nukes as well as they are much better. After that, late one rainy evening, it turns out we actually have two new lovers. Apparently Kirkosh tried to woo Min by describing her as a breathtaking river. Oh my, Min was very attracted and apparently the two are now in love. Quite the lady killer, isn't he? We obviously of course would very quickly end up building them a wooden double bed, that way they could snuggle together at night and be quite happy while doing so. I only hope that this new love between the two of them doesn't cause any issues for anyone else, such as the other mercenaries or just the Empire in general, of course. Although it's not as though we're not already accustomed to having a love triangle among our ranks. The good news couldn't last forever though because the following morning we ended up having a raid from the Confederacy of Bana. It would appear that they've gathered up just outside the small hills around our base and are preparing for an attack. Although I did see something that I don't think we've ever seen among the Thromboian tribes thus far. It would appear that they are getting with the modern times. They're actually using some makeshift weaponry. Well now I know that we didn't sell them those guns and I know that they don't have the means or knowledge to create firearms so I'm assuming that someone else has been selling them these weapons, possibly the Mountain Devil Mafia. Though we can't be sure just yet, that is the 
only other faction stupid enough and willing to sell to these Thromboian tribes that are going to try to kill everyone else, of course. Regardless, though, I don't really care. We had planned on shooting the shit out of them with a few mortar shells up until the point that I realized that these anti-aircraft guns, though much more accurate than mortars, unfortunately do not have near enough range to reach them over there. I didn't know that. Ah, that's what we in the business call a classic rat night oopsie daisy. But where our AA cannons have failed us, our roadkill tank shall not. We rolled it out immediately over to the large group of enemies preparing a massive shell bombardment. We managed to fire at them twice, hitting many enemies. I ended up pulling back for just a moment because they were really starting to crowd around the area, firing at us, and I didn't want the tank to get destroyed just yet. We pulled back around to get yet another shot off, and this did severely injure several of the enemies. But now we were out of ammo, so it was time to pull the tank back into the garage and out of the way. It would appear that even though many of their members were crippled and severely injured, they were all too stupid to run away. That was quite alright though, as we still had the sand viper full of ammo. We would immediately bring it out as well as our mercenaries. Now, of course, don't get me wrong, I love our brand new tank that we built last episode, but nothing is as good as the classics like the old sand viper here where we could fire at them as well as run several of them over, which of course you know we did. As we were taking our little stroll through enemy lines, we could hear the pitter-patter of heads and bodies bouncing off the armor of the sand viper. We had ran over so many of them, in fact, that they had decided to flee, the smartest idea that they've had all day, I'm sure. Among those attempting to flee was their chief. Unfortunately for Chief Tizera, we hadn't planned on letting him escape again, and the Sand Viper had him in its clutches, ready to strike. I will say, though, that I admire his dedication. He was a tough old cat. We ran him over several times, pinning him against the mountain, shooting at him. He was pretty strong, up until the point that Richard and Kirkosh jumped out of the Sand Viper and blasted him into oblivion, which finally took him out. Finally, we've defeated one of the largest threats to our gun empire thus far. This chieftain was responsible for many raids. Now, of course, this is good news, but there is also a little bit of bad news here. Obviously, killing a renowned chieftain among their tribes is going to draw a little bit more attention, which could be a problem, especially since they're beginning to buy firearms from other factions, of course. Some other good did end up coming out of us defeating the raid, though, in the form of a thromboyan woman named Nurzak, who we would actually attempt to recruit. That way, we can add her onto our mercenary squad, and we can continue expanding our private army. Speaking of expanding our private army, as well as our empire, and more importantly, of course, our influence across the planet of Degum, we need more money. So we're actually having Richard here build some advanced components so that we can work on new bionics. The first bionic that we're actually going to be making is a bionic arm. This bionic arm is a monumental milestone for us because it is not the first bionic we've created, but it will indeed be the very first bionic that we've actually sold to someone. Bionics, of course, are not easily accessible to either side of this global conflict, and we intend on changing that. For a price, of course. A very hefty price, as you can see. That's just supply and demand, baby. If we are making them, we get to make the prices. It's only fair. We had Scott and Ruland immediately begin loading up the rifle runner with the new bionic that we had created, as well as several different types of weapons, uh, bayonets, knives, rifles, pistols, basically everything. We had a massive stockpile of weapons still at this point, and we really needed to unload it. We would actually end up trading with the Marshal Service first, as we've been doing a lot of trading with the Rebels, so we want to ensure that both sides, of course, are well armed. And in doing so, of course, that does also mean that we wouldn't sell everything to them marshal service, we would be sure to leave about half of the inventory to take back to a nearby rebel settlement, that way we could arm them as well, truly trading with both sides now. Back home, Downs would finally conclude her extensive research into large nuclear bombs, and they are now available for us to create. A few hours after that, Scott and Ruland had finally returned home with a smorgasbord of silver from all of the weapons and whatnot that they had sold. We are truly forming quite the little bank here in our vault. With a very large stockpile of mostly silver and jade, but also a little bit of gold. 
We would have more gold in our stockpile, but we've been having to use it for some electronics and different products, of course. It hardly matters, though, because in this desert, baby, silver is what talks. Moving on, though, last episode I asked you guys for a name for our new roadkill tank, and you guys provided those, and I've actually chosen one, of course. I'm going to be naming it the Armadillo. Now, I did end up seeing quite a few people who actually ended up suggesting the name Armadillo, but the very first comment that I had saw with this originally was for from Sasha FYI. So thank you ever so much, Sasha, for the wonderful name for the tank. I do also agree that it is a very fitting name for the tank, as the tank is quite the roly-poly armadillo type, right? It's a little butterball, if you will. Along with the brand new wonderful name, I also decided to give it a brand new wonderful coat of paint. Now, I didn't really make it look like an armadillo. I actually didn't go with any camo or anything. I kind of gave it a rusted look, which I felt was very fitting here for the desert and for a private gun army and uh, kind of mercenary militia, right? For me, personally, I very much love the new paint job and the name, and I hope you guys do as well. Last episode, also, I asked you guys for some names for our new iguana, and there were a a lot of really wonderful names, of course, but I ended up going with Blood Diamond as it seemed very fitting for the color of the iguana. This, of course, was also said by our good friend Seamus Finnegan1164, who actually came up with the name Blood Diamond as well. So thank you ever so much for the name, Seamus. I very much like it, and I want to say a big thank you to everyone who left a comment. I saw a lot of wonderful names, of course, unfortunately, though, we can only choose one. At one point, I noticed that poor Scott here was lying on an operating table, and I had no idea why. Well, it looks like he's actually in withdrawal from Psykite for whatever reason. So we had to have Richard come and administer some tea into his old lips, and that way he could finally get up and go do something. It's very sad to see Scott begin spiraling down like this with addiction to Psykite, as I do believe that it's brought on by the stress of being one of the two biggest warlords in the Noquan Desert, and honestly on the entire planet. Running the SNR Rifle Company, no doubt, is extremely exhausting. Especially seeing how Scott here is the face, the liaison of our trade with these other factions. Speaking of which, we're actually going out to do a bit of trading with both sides of the war and we're going to be buying a special material. I would tell you what it is, of course, but I would like for it to be a little bit of a surprise at least, but you could probably already guess what I'm buying. I will give you a little bit of a hint though, it is a special rock that glows that makes your skin fall off underneath your clothes. Now this very, very special rock that we're purchasing requires a very, very special place to be kept, of course, far away from any of our people to keep their skin from falling off, just as the rhyme foretold earlier. So we're actually going to be digging a narrow, slender tunnel to a very small little area here where we can store it. This new hallway and new room would take quite a while, so long, in fact, that unfortunately we hadn't finished it by the time that Scott and Rulant returned home with their new special rock, so the cat's out of the bag, yes. I bought uranium, and a lot of it. We ended up purchasing 171 uranium. Now the marshals, nor the rebels, really knew what we needed it for, nor did they know the capabilities of this uranium, so they were practically giving it away. The large nuclear bombs require 200 uranium, so accompanied with what we already have in storage, this should be plenty. My friends, you are witnessing history in the making for this planet. The very first nuclear bomb created in a warlord's garage essentially, Richard has made the first nuke. As Richard slowly and very carefully took the nuke all the way to its new home in the safe room, he began to realize that nothing would ever be the same. There was no going back now. Pandora's box had finally been opened, and there was no way to close it, no way to seal it shut once more. There was only adapting to it, overcoming it, and surviving it. To think that this very small metallic item made of bits of components, plasteel and just normal steel, in our little production room, as many other things had been made before, could level entire cities. The power that now rests upon our shoulders is crushing and overbearing. I believe I'm beginning to see why Scott dulls his reality with Psychite T. The new destructive weapon that we have created required our protection from any other faction that wished to use it without our consent, of course. 
But better yet, we required protection from it. That is why I've buried it under this mountain, and that is also why I've decided to build reinforced blast walls as well as four reinforced blast doors to try and keep us safe if it were to detonate prematurely. I also ended up making some reinforced metal flooring as well, just to ensure that if it does go off, the blast will be contained and limited to a very small area. I realize that the new section here where we're actually keeping the nuke may look a little bit silly as an addition to the base. It kind of looks like one big spaceship and this is like a very small antenna sticking off the side or something along those lines. But my friends, you know I always like to ask you for your feedback and your suggestions because I love you guys and I always say that this feels like our series. Well. I am going to leave it up to you guys and your suggestions. What do we do with this nuclear bomb? I'm not really sure on the price of them just yet. I haven't really looked. I'm fairly sure that they're very expensive, of course. But what do we do with it? Do we sell it to another faction? Do we sell it to the rebels? Do we sell it to the Marshal Service? Is it so powerful that maybe we don't do that at all? Given what we know about both sides, there is a possibility that if we were to sell it to either of them, they would start nuking each other into oblivion and one of them would come out on top, leaving us with little to no clients, of course. But let me know what you guys think about that in the comment section down below. I would love to see what you guys think. Now that we finally reach our big goal for this episode though, I'm going to focus on a few smaller minute details around the base and just in general of course. Since our AA guns can't actually reach too far outside of the limits of our base, I'm actually going to build a mortar for any long range attacks that we may need to do for now. It'll suffice right now up until the point that we actually get an artillery cannon which is much better. Once that was completed, we would actually begin work on a very large and long road from the eastern entrance of our base all the way to the new tunnel that we had built early on in the episode. Now, of course, with us being out here in the desert, we don't really have to worry about a lot of vegetation growing and blocking our path on the road, but we do still want to have a very clear cut and easy path to follow out of the area here when we're going to do trading or anything like that. And I would think it would go without saying, of course, but it is much faster to drive on asphalt than it is through the sand here. I also felt that this was as good a time as any to begin upgrading our defenses just a little bit. I was going to dig through this small section of the hill here right next to where our turrets and our barricades for the entrance are. Uh, we were actually going to create something of a pillbox style here with some embrasures and some cover. Essentially just a small box within the hillside here where we could hide and fire at our enemies with a very low risk of getting shot in the head. Of course, as I've mentioned before, the embrasures provide a lot of cover effectiveness, but so do the sandbags, and when they're stacked on top of each other like this, it makes it pretty hard to kill us. It should also make it extremely difficult for them to kill us if we're raining down hellfire upon their heads with our rifles, but also with the three manual auto turrets that we're installing in here as well making this pillbox quite the deadly pill to swallow indeed. And I don't mean to beat a dead horse here, but with these mounted turrets and their cover effectiveness, the embrasures, and the sandbags all stacked up, I wish them luck in trying to shoot us. Later on into the night, I realized as we were doing all that minute work, we had actually recruited the thromboian woman known as Nurzak, who has a good mining skill, an okay cooking, shooting, any other skill really, and she is also a night owl and sanguine, and she is going to be joining our mercenaries as you guessed. We had made her some light combat armor, a new helmet, a bandana, and then she would equip a plasteel longsword as well as an assault rifle. With the growing population of mercenaries into our private army grows a need for some residential areas, some new bedrooms and whatnot where people can actually sleep and just enjoy themselves, a little square under the mountain to call their own. Obviously, of course, we're doing this because people need their own bedrooms and they need a place to sleep, but also you need to think that this private army, they're not doing it out of the kindness of their hearts. They're doing it for riches, for maybe a, just a place to stay, for food. I mean, it's a very tough world out there, but we don't want them turning on us, right? We want them to be happy and we want them to have nice things. I also ended up mining out a small section of the hill here between the hallway that will actually go into our peel box where we'll be fighting many enemies, I'm sure, and to the hallway of our base. I thought it might be best to have a direct connection there, that way 
way if someone's injured we can get them in quite quickly. I also put doors on either side that way it acts something like a buffer in case somehow enemies do make it through. And a bit of a side note here, I'm also pretty glad that we did it because we found a large vein of steel ore. A few days later, I spotted Scott out in the field, and you know, since this series has begun, we've had a couple of birthdays for Scott here, resulting in him becoming frail with a bad back. It didn't help either that he had a gunshot that hit his spine at one point, and with his new psychite addiction, he's becoming extremely slow, with his moving only being about 20%. Look, at some point, we're going to have to face facts. Okay, Scott's getting up there in age. He's only 55, so he's not that old, but he does have underlying health issues, and that with the bullet that hit his spine at some point there, it's not looking too good for him. We'll most likely end up having to have someone else take his place as the face of our trading, right? But of course, we love Scott ever so much, and I didn't want to just throw him away, so I decided to have Richard use some of our resources to make him a bionic spine. Richard would also be the one to perform this very delicate and intense surgery, on Scott's spine because he was the only one that had this high of a medical skill. Unfortunately though, I believe I kind of jumped the gun here and the surgery ended up failing. Luckily, the injuries sustained by Scott were nothing too bad and he did survive of course, but I shouldn't have done this so quickly I suppose. I maybe should have waited until we had someone with a better medical skill. I just, you know, I didn't want to lose Scott and I'm very afraid that that's going to happen. While I was a bit disheartened that the surgery was a complete shit show and was totally botched unfortunately, as well as all the resources being wasted on a bionic spine, I was pretty excited that we were building some new types of weapons. We're actually going to be making some EMP weapons, starting out with EMP grenades. I think this type of weaponry would be perfect for our customers as they can utilize it to shut down their enemies' electronics, such as vehicles and mechs if they have any, things like that. As Richard was hard at work creating EMP weapons, Ibiko was actually making some metal armors. That way we can try and have all of this ready by the beginning of next episode to sell to the marshals and to the rebels. Or possibly anyone else that would like to purchase them for this fair price that we're selling them for, of course, such as the Outlanders if they ever come back around. We haven't seen them very much ever since the rebels cracked down on the slave trade. Now then though, as we wind down to the end of the episode here, I am going to discuss a few things that have been mentioned by some of you guys. First off, we actually have a comment here by our good friend another 40 k fan 63 who says there's actually a lore idea here, and you know me, I do love some good lore for our series. Uh, you were saying, though, that Scott's debt is actually a culmination of all the money he owes to various different groups, with the MDM only being one group. The other groups have been supplying the MDM with weapons and volunteers slash slaves to help help collect on Scott's debt. That is a very interesting idea for some lore, and I will officially canonize it here if uh, if that's needed, of course. I really like it. Um, I want to say, of course, that I think the MDM, the Mountain Devil Mafia, uh, would be the main group, of course, maybe the most powerful and whatnot, so these other groups are going to be uh, choosing them as the head group that will actually be performing the attacks with their men and their supplies and things like that. Who are these other groups? Possibly smaller gangs and things things like that from the Outlands and uh, different uh, tribes even maybe. Uh, it is possible as well maybe they're receiving uh, some funding and some backing from one of the larger factions and maybe they're keeping it a secret. Perhaps the Oak Foundation as they are a very secretive faction anyhow. And next up, before I let you all go today, I do want to show off some amazing fan art by our good friend Ken King, who I did ask for permission just to make sure it's okay for me to show these in the video, to which of course they said it was cool, so here we go. First up, we actually have some amazing art here of uh, Scott, Richard, Downs, Nino, as well as Machu. Of course, they're all uh, rats, uh, you know, uh, because I am the rat knight, it makes sense, of course, uh, but these are awesome depictions of the character as rats. I really love them. They look really good. And we also have some art here of humans, thromboians, and impids as rats with some pretty um, standard characteristics to kind of show, you know, their race. And we also have some wonderful art of Jin Jin, the impid who is actually part of the Oak Foundation. Uh, once again, thank you ever so much to Kin King. I love these. They're amazing. I love fan art. Um, anytime I can show it off as well, I'm always down to do that. So thank you. If any of you guys 
guys ever want to send me some fan art or anything like that, feel free to join our Discord. It's in the channel link, of course. Uh, you can send it there. There's a specific channel for it in the server. You can also email it to my business email, which you can also find in the uh, channel description here on YouTube. But lastly, people, I want to thank you ever so much for watching today's episode. I love you guys. Thank you for continuing to support me in this series on the channel. And just thank you for always being the best audience and the best uh, just community. It's, it's always amazing uh, making this stuff for you guys. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Hi there, I actually don't normally talk at this portion of the video at the end here, but I did want to mention uh, if any of you guys uh, are patrons or if you have been a patron in the past, I've had a lot of people, um, the memberships have ended and stuff like that. I'm going to start removing some names pretty soon. I'm not trying to threaten you guys to make you support me or anything like that, of course. Uh, if you guys want to donate on Patreon, you can. If you don't or you can't, that's cool too. Don't worry about it. Uh, I just wanted to notify you guys that way you're aware because uh, you know some people might not be aware that your um, membership is done and stuff like that. So I'm going to start removing names. I don't want anyone to uh, be upset that their name got removed or anything like that. So uh, if you want your name to continue being in the end credits, of course, just uh, you know check it out. See if you're still a patron, if you're still active, stuff like that. Uh, if you want to support, go for it. If you don't, that's cool too. I love you guys though, and uh, goodbye for real this time.